Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful for your love and for your grace, for the privilege that we have of gathering together to worship you, to enjoy the fellowship and, and to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit take the hour. We are keenly aware of how little we know and we have the promise of your word that, that he, the Spirit, will lead us into all truth. May he filter out the foolishness and the ignorance that may be said this morning in order that Christ might be glorified and that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're about to close out this chapter in uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. But before we do, I'd like to spend a few moments in review. Now, you'll remember that the Holy Spirit has led Paul and Barnabas to go to Jerusalem and present before the elders there at Jerusalem the gospel that they preach. Because at least at Galatia, there were those who were saying that what what Paul preached was fine. I mean, it was, it was a great beginning, but it required more. It meant that you had to be circumcised. And so there was a division among the believers as to whether or not the finished work of Jesus Christ was sufficient or whether something had to be added. In particular, the legalists were adding circumcision and that uh, without circumcision, they, they were not properly the children of God. Historically, down through the years, it has been the natural thing, the common thing, for Christians to always add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Man is just inclined that way. In our text, we read, and those of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Historically, Christianity has added water baptism to the finished work of Christ. It's not difficult at all to find any number of people who, who point out that not only do you need to believe in Jesus Christ, I mean, you got to do that, but that's not enough. You need to be water baptized, and they've added two conditions. Belief and being baptized. Both of those are operations on the part of the individual before what Christ did becomes effective. It doesn't become effective until you do those things. The common thought appears to be that in Adam you were made a sinner, which became effective when you sinned. And in Christ, you were made righteous, which became effective when you believed, if they even believe that at all, that you're made righteous. And that, of course, presents a problem because that isn't what the Scriptures say. It's not what, it's not what the Word of God said. Dearly beloved, you cannot take verses of Scripture, at least in my mind, and add them to something that isn't there, that by the one act of obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, the many were effectually made righteous if they believe, but they, they're not made righteous if they don't believe. You can't do that, folks. It doesn't say that. It says, in the same way in which you were made a sinner in Adam, you were made righteous in Christ by the disobedience of Adam. You became a sinner. By the obedience of Christ, you became righteous. And the argument of the Word of God is that Jesus Christ was a sufficient payment. But the trouble is, much of the idea of payment has been left out of modern Christian thinking. It's just been left out of modern Christian thought. When we read in the Word that He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, it's difficult to get people to realize that the word redeem means the paying of a price. The paying of a price. A price was paid. 
And the argument in your mind has to be, was that price sufficient? Was it enough? Did Jesus Christ do enough? Or did He just do what He did and leave the rest up to you? Did, did it accomplish what God intended? We do not worship some old man upstairs who sits in a rocking chair hoping against hope that you're going to believe. That's not the God we worship. At, at least not here on this platform. I hear sermons on Hebrews chapter 3. You know, with whom was he not well pleased? That generation that did not believe. Why? They didn't enter in. They didn't enter in because of unbelief. And if you make the entering in heaven, then folks, you, you have that generation all going to hell. You know, that, let's see, that would be Moses, that would be Aaron, uh, and a whole bunch of others. You would have people whom the Lord says at least 20 times that I redeemed my people out of the land of Egypt. And then you put all of those who came out of the land of Egypt in hell. And don't be shocked at that. That is typical biblical teaching in the modern generation that because they didn't believe, they didn't enter in. Well, of course they didn't enter in. Of course they didn't enter in. They didn't enter into rest. 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 If you don't believe what God did for you is sufficient, you don't have much rest. I mentioned to someone this morning, I received an email. The girl came home, looked real discouraged. Her mom says, well, what's wrong? She said, well, Tom proposed last night. And her mother said, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, I, I thought you loved him. Well, I found out last night that he's an atheist. He doesn't... Uh, believe that there's a hell, you know, and she and she said, "Well, you marry him. You and I will teach him that there is." I, I don't know why I threw that in. I it, I thought it was a little funny, but folks, people without number want to make the entering into his rest heaven. They want in in type to make when the Jews passed into the promised land going to heaven. It was not. It was not. It was entering into God's rest. You enter into God's rest by, by what? By trusting Him. By believing Him. And beginning in chapter 2 on, we've been looking at the genitive, the faith of Christ. I spent some time on that. All of your modern translations are going to probably have faith in Christ. And I want to repeat again, we've done this many times, so I'm going to try to do it quickly. I want to repeat again, nobody here has to agree with what is said from this pulpit. Nobody. Not, it is not the purpose of this ministry for me to be a dictator. Somehow, God is privileged me to handle His Word, and I, I try to handle it very carefully. I'm terrified of teaching something that isn't true, and I'm freely willing to admit to you that, that I don't have all the answers, I don't know everything, and I'm freely willing to admit to you that the genitive in the Greek can be taken as subjectively or objectively. You have to decide. You could translate it faith in Christ. You could translate it faithfulness of Christ. You have every right to translate it either way. What, but what you have to do, folks, is you have to look at the context and decide what in your mind makes the most sense. And you do that from the context. We have to look at the Word of God and compare Scripture with Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. It always will. How were you made righteous? By the obedience of Christ. Not by anything you did. Christ declares that I came to do Thy will, O Lord. So the obedience of Christ was the will of God, the faithfulness of Christ in what God willed for Him to do. And it would seem that scripturally, the most logical way to take the genitive, if you want to be consistent with the Word of God, would be the faithfulness of Christ. 
just like it says and it's going to say in Galatians later on. The, the root word is pastuo, and it's a word to believe. It means to trust, to faith, not receive, but to believe, trust, faith, faithfulness. That's pastuo. That's what the word means. And from the root, we have several words, and we have to decide what we're going to do with them. If you have a modern translation, it likely says, more than likely it says faith in Christ, and that's, that's again our problem. If it's your faith in Christ, then what God did, what He did was only contingent. That was what Pelagius and Arminius and all those guys taught. That what, what God did was contingent upon your faith and trust in Him contingent upon your believing and that's the thing that scholars argued against for years and years and years and these things were consistently listen to me they were consistently thrown out of the church there isn't a place where any doctrinal summation and church synod ever agreed with the teachings of Pelagius or Arminius or Erasmus and they had lots of followers. In fact, they're the majority followers today. Okay? This is the fact, folks, that we have to, to confront in all this. But if you do not believe that what Christ did was contingent, that is, it does not depend upon you, then you understand total depravity. You understand your total inability to respond to God. You, you can't please God. You can't do anything to accept Him. You can't fulfill the law. You certainly can't fulfill the law of God. You are totally depraved. The flesh profits nothing. And so you're cast back upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now God exhorts you to believe. Why? Why? Well, I mean, because it makes a big difference. That's how you enter into rest and peace. That's the way that you get away from fear of death. That's why you know there's no judgment for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Many Christians are walking around today unaware of that fact. All human beings are invested somehow with a conscious threat of judgment. It's just built into our DNA. In fact, it's the universal moral law that makes any Christian realize that there was a designer behind all of this. A designer behind all of creation. If there was no designer, if this all just happened by chance, then there's no meaning and there is no sense in morality and, there, and there's certainly no sense in me standing here. Then there would not be a uni universal moral law, but there is, which I've tried to illustrate at times when the... the a native in darkest Africa, you know, when you take his chicken, he knows that when you take his chicken, it's wrong. it was wrong. He shows that universal moral law. And so you have no ability to please God. I believe that the text says that the promise that stems from the faithfulness of Christ might be given to the believing. But it, believing is not a condition. It's not a condition. Even faith is a gift. Now the word faith of Christ there and believing is the same root that the promise from the faithfulness of Christ might be given to the faithful, the believing of Christ. To the believing. And it's a matter of the translator to decide, well, just exactly what the Holy Spirit is saying, the thought the Holy Spirit is trying to convey. We close the third chapter by the grand statement of the Word of God. It's a first-class condition. Since you are Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, singular, and heirs according to promise. Wonderful, wonderful verse. That takes us into the fourth chapter. Bear in mind there were no chapter divisions back there you know, in the original texts. The, the thought continues on as it was going on. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, 
but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. The purpose of those tutors and governors was to guard him as far as the inheritance is concerned. It was basically to keep Israel from bowing down and worshiping idols. When we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. The world, okay? There, there is a religious system. There's always been. The problem with much of modern Christianity is they make, they make worldliness something that it, it really isn't. Marvel not that the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. You know, and I, well, that's lip, what is that? That's lipstick and high heeled shoes. Folks, lipstick and high heeled shoes doesn't hate you, or doesn't hate Christ. It's amazing to me what Christians have called the world. The world, folks, in the Word of God, most of the time is a religious system. Every human being is under some religious system. The astounding thing, the really astounding thing, is that many people who consider themselves to be, you know, brilliant, they isolate themselves from any religious system. An example would be the Atheist Society of America. They contend that they're not a religious system and nothing could be further from the truth. Of course they are. Of course they are. They bow down in absolute servitude to the, a God named Chance. Folks, I'd rather worship the Lord God who spoke the worlds into existence than I would some God of Chance. For if the God is the God, if the God is the God of chance, there is no meaning, there is no purpose, there is no morality, but it, it is a religious system. And every human is a slave to some kind of a system. In fact, the Holy Spirit will develop that thought more fully in, in just a moment. When the fullness of time has come, time that he should send forth his son made from woman made under law and that's of course the incarnation of our lord and savior amazing don't, these things tend to slip by if you're not careful and you don't look out just watch out is it is supremely important to see that that verse is a clear reference to the deity of our lord jesus christ he sent forth his son he did not become the Son when He was virgin born. He sent forth His Son. That was the great argument between Calvin and, and, and Servetus. Servetus was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ was not equal with God, that He, he didn't exist before the virgin birth, and that He therefore became an offspring of God, and by that much, well, something less than God, and if you're familiar at all with history, church history, you know that Servetus was burned at the stake in Geneva. And Calvin, wouldn't you know it, was the judge in that trial. Now, whether or not that should have happened is not the purpose of this message. What I am saying is that a great many people have followed... Servetus since then. You know that Jesus Christ had a beginning at the virgin birth. More people believe that than, than what you'd think. He was made from woman, not from man. The virgin birth is clearly taught in verse 4. His deity is clearly taught. He was the son before he was made from woman. He was the son of God before he was the virgin born Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So it was the Son who came forth, made of woman, not man, woman, made under the law or under law. And His purpose, His whole purpose was to redeem them that were under law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Fabulous verse of Scripture. To redeem them. The word, as I've mentioned, is, is ek agarazo. Here it means to purchase out of the marketplace, to take out of marketability. That means to buy and never sell again. 
You purchase something, you keep it forever. There are two purposes, at least, there's probably more, but there's at least two purposes. I've mentioned this several times. You know, to buy something and resell it and make a profit, like kind of like I did with a horse that, that didn't turn out too well. And then the other, to buy it as a prized possession and keep it forever. And that's the word here, ek agarazo. It means to take out of marketability by paying a price. The word is redeem. You could translate it ransom. We as modern Christians fail to see the fact that a price was paid and that that price was paid by Jesus Christ and that price was sufficient and, and what a horrible price it was. We need to be careful, to be very careful with this book. If, if, the, if, the, if my computer anticipates a colon, a semicolon just won't work and our language in Christianity and biblical thought ought to be just as precise. We are saved by the life of Christ. We are redeemed by the price that Christ paid by His sacrifice on our behalf. We are born again by the will of God. Scripture is clear on that. It wasn't your will, but by the will of God. That's how we were born again not the will of the flesh. The reason Christ came was not to perform miracles. It wasn't to present some kind of a, a, a this super example that you might follow Him as an example. The reason that He came was to do the will of God and the will of God was that He might pay the price necessary to deliver us. He redeemed us. He ransomed us. He did that. Don't you think He done a good job of it? to redeem them that were under law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Adoption of sons. The word adoption is a compound word in the Greek. It means son and place. So you could literally translate it the placing of a son. The only place that we find that word are in the epistles and a lot of people don't like the word adoption. Let me tell you, it does not by any stretch mean in this verse, that those who were not sons are made sons. That, that's not what it means. It, it's clear in the context that we are already heirs. That is, we're the recipient of the inheritance. Whatever the Father provided, I don't know what all that consists of. Uh, it's what's provided by the Father. Heirs according to the promise. Verse 29 of chapter 3. I don't know what that inheritance is, but whatever it is, it's all ours. And I know that it includes redemption. I do know that. I know that it includes being placed in the heavenlies, co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. I know that it includes all blessings, all spiritual blessings in Christ. And it's what has been provided by the Father, not by us. The Lord Jesus Christ came to redeem those the Father gave Him. He did that. Modern Christianity seems, if not to infer, to plainly state that it was an offer of redemption and it's up to you to make it solid and to ver you know, verify it. It's not, it's not in the text. In order to do that, you have to write that in there and you have to do violence to the Word of God. The purpose in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the purpose in the incarnation is to redeem them that were under law that we might receive the placing of a son. The simplest definition I can give you, and I happen to think it's a good, good definition, you'll get a lot of criticism uh, from it. You are physically born and you are spiritually born. The term in uh, the epistles for being spiritually born, born again, is adoption. This is the reference, dearly beloved, to your spiritual birth. John chapter 3, ye must be born again. It's a verse everybody's familiar with. So you got to do something. That's the dominant theme of the modern evangelist. I think you would all have to agree that is the modern theme of modern evangelism. 
and yet it was never, listen, it was never used by any evangelist in the Bible. Paul never used it. No place did the Apostle Paul, the greatest evangelist that God ever raised up, ever tell you that you needed to be born again. And that you would do that by coming down some, walking down some sawdust trail and taking the minister's hand never occurred. Why? Why? Because you're not born from above by anything that you do. You're born, you're born from above by the will of God, born not by your own will, but by the will of God. <clears throat> that is the biblical truth, folks. <clears throat> and what the Holy Spirit is saying here is that you were born again. You were born spiritually because of the Incarnation because of the death of Jesus Christ in your place, substitutionary death, there is not one verse of Scripture. Not one. There is not one passage of Scripture that would indicate to you that Jesus Christ redeemed you by keeping the law. And yet there's a lot of modern thought that suggests that. I don't believe it's even biblical to say that Jesus kept the law He didn't break the law. And He lived under the law. But folks, He was above the law. He redeemed you by dying in your place. And that's a, that was a terrible, terrible price. But that was the purpose of His coming. Why He came to ransom them that were under law that we might receive birth from above the placing of a son not making someone a son who you know wasn't a son, but giving a spiritual birth, the sons of God born again, born from above by God. What Christ said to Nicodemus is not something Nicodemus had to do. That is a serious misconception. It's something that had to be done to Nicodemus. It, it, the must there in the text is the must of necessity not obligation. If done, it's done by God, not by anything Nicodemus did. And because ye are sons, because ye are sons, look, look at the power of that verse. Because ye are sons. There, there's no doubt that that's true. Because ye are sons, wow, I mean... You're not a son because you feel like it. You're not a son because you decided to be. You're not a son for any reason that can stem from you at all. You are a son by birth. That's what I was pointing out in verse 5. The adoption of sons. You might as well phrase that born from above because that's what it is. And you are a son. Or technically, you know, a daughter. Why is it that so many people today who profess to be Christians feel that they can lose that sonship? You know, the answer to that may be that they never had it. I don't, I don't know. The grandeur of that statement ought to grip your hearts, folks. Because you are sons. Why, why are you a son? Because God sent forth His Son to pay your price. He ransomed you and placed you he gave you new birth. You're born from above. What Christ was saying to Nicodemus is that's what's got to be done. He wasn't saying to Nicodemus, that's Nicodemus, there's something you got to do. He was saying to Nicodemus, that's what has to be done. You must be. It's a true statement. You must be born from above. But that is done by God, not man. You are sons because God gave you spiritual birth. You were born from above by His power, by His will, by, and even at His timing, and by the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price. He ransomed you and you belong to Him. You're no longer your own. 
we can refer back to verse 29, since you are Christ's, that's a marvelous, marvelous statement. God is the one who identified you with Christ. God is the one who had you put on Christ. And since you are His, you are an heir of God. You're Abraham's seed because you are sons. God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart and my heart, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. It was God who sent forth the Spirit of His Son. I don't know how much. A, a, I know a, it's got to be a huge percentage of modern Christianity that wants to go back in time and, and, and insists that somehow or other you have to get the Spirit. Got to get the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit of God, folks, you're not God's. And that's the clear statement of Romans chapter 8. It's the same statement here. Because you're sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. Did He miss yours or, or the next guy's or whatever? Come on, you can't ch charge God with such negligence as that. It's because you are sons that God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. And He did that. Well, Steve, I don't feel like He did. He did it. Okay, If you're His, He did it. Crying, Abba, Father. Now, the word crying, first of all, is to cry out intently. You know, kind of like the way I guess some people have cried out, you know, you know, in my case, except in agony. Here, the word Abba is the Aramaic word Father. The word Father is the Greek word Father, and it's preceded by the definite article. So if you were simply reading that as a translator, you would read, The Father... The Father, and a little bit of a work would lead you to conclude that the Aramic expression was the more common expression. It was the more common because the common language in Christ's day during His time was Aramic. It astounds me as Bible teachers always say, well, you know, of course you all know Christ spoke in Aramic. Now, I don't know that. I don't know that because I never heard him. He may have spoken in Aramaic. I'm certain that there were times where he probably did speak in Aramaic. I also have no doubt that there were times where that he spoke in Hebrew. And I also have no doubt that there were uh, times that he spoke in Greek. You know, folks, we consider ourselves to be an educated country, an educated generation, a 2024, I mean, you know, we're a bunch of smart people, and they were dumb back then. Let me tell you, the average person in Jesus Christ today could speak six or seven languages. The average American today has difficulty with one. These were not poorly educated people. They vastly exceeded the normal education in America today. I mean, by leaps and bounds. But the word Abba, is an Aramic word because it was the more common language of the day. More people in Israel, uh, more, I mean, they spoke more Aramic than they did Hebrew or Koine Greek. But because it was common, people have said, well, we have to look here at the word Aramic word father, you know, as common. And so some translators, you know, make it uh, daddy or, or papa or or pop or dad or, you know, I don't want to breed any familiarity that's not biblical. I believe that God is our loving Heavenly Father. I believe that without question, the Lord Jesus Christ not only calls us brethren, but friends. Now, I do not believe that we should take God lightly. The expression, Abba, Father, became very common back in Christ's day were that they included both the Greek and the Aramic just to emphasize the fatherhood of God. I believe that what the text is saying is that God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts 
The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of God, and it's called the Spirit of Christ. And we have the deity and the trinity all taught in this verse. Because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son. So we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. I believe the text says, as simple as I can make it, you know, if you are Christ's and you're trusting Him and believing His Word, you know it to be true. You know that it's true. I was raised in a, uh, most of my coming up, uh, I was raised in an Armenian church where it was constantly taught. Uh, in fact, time and time and time again, uh, you know, the phone would ring and my, my mother would hang it up. You know, we have to have special prayer. Again, Chris, is, Chris was seen going into a movie and he's going to hell. We got to get him saved again. We got to get Chris Corey saved again. We, we got Chris Corey saved, I think, a hundred times. And it, and it just went on and, and on and on like that. And I began to question that as I studied the Word. I praise God that He led me into His Word. And I'd, I'd go to these people in this church. They always got mad at me. They, they were absolutely convinced that you could lose your salvation or a, per, or, or a person could. But, 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 well, they were absolutely convinced that they hadn't lost theirs. I, funny, I, I didn't talk to one person in that church that thought that they had ever lost their salvation. But they certainly felt that you could lose yours. They knew everybody else could, particularly Chris Corey. I often think about him. I wonder where he's at today. You know, we sure prayed for him a lot. But you know, I never met one. I never met one of them that thought that they ever had or could lose their own salvation. They they would admit that, you know. Oh, oh yeah, 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 I, I could lose it, but I never have. There is something about the Holy Spirit that has you say, yeah, that's true. I believe that you can read all kinds of things and all of a sudden a sentence sort of pops out, pops off the page at you. Wow, that's what God's Word says. And I believe His Spirit is bearing witness with our spirits that we are, in fact, His children. The Word the expression, Abba, Father, says the Holy Spirit is crying out in an, in an intimate way with God the Father. You've been born from above. You are His Son. And because you're sons, not, not if you want to, want to be a son, or I have, you know, I got great news for you, you folks. You know, if you'd like to be a son, you could, you could be a son. All you got to do is do X, Y, and Z or whatever. I, how can you even use language like that? If, if you'd like to be, you could be born again? Well, well, I didn't even have any like on the first time I was born. Folks, it is no wonder Nicodemus was confused. And it's no wonder that Paul, not in one of the epistles, did he or Apollos or anybody else ever, ever preach the modern evangelistic message that we hear day after day after day. Why? Because they knew that birth is brought about by the parents, not by the baby. Because you are sons, no doubt about it, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, showing you that you have an intimate relationship with Him. Intimate. It's intimate. This is true of all those whom Christ redeemed, even you. And there are a tremendous number of conservative Christians who I believe they really love the Lord, they really love this book, who still limit the work of Christ. That paying the price is only valid for those who accept 
or believe or repent or be baptized or whatever, whatever else, which all of that follows after. And you have to write that stuff in there. You have to, you have to do violence for people. You have to do violence to the Word of God to do that. He came with one purpose and He completed it. What kind of job you think He did? He didn't do it. Do the part. He didn't do it partially. He didn't make any offers. He completed his work, and he rose from the dead. And you, dearly beloved, are sons. Let's pray. Gracious heavenly Father, once again, we're thankful for the privilege, the opportunity that we have to think about your precious word. May the Holy Spirit take what's been said and filter it so that truth remains. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.